Uh, for our next speaker, uh, I um, want to put some perspective here. All of you probably think that you are dedicated because you woke up this morning at 6 or 6.30 to be here at 7. And, and some of you might have ranted, but they, you didn't say anything, which is a good thing. Uh, but, uh, but you got here at 7 or 7.30 uh, to start very early. But I'll tell you that's not, that's not dedication. I'll tell you what dedication looks like. If you married on Saturday, this is just last Saturday, and ran out of your honeymoon to come to give a talk here, that would be dedication, and that's exactly what JT has done. JT, absolutely, he's right there. So JT is uh, with IBM. He works on the open power uh, platform, and he uh, has been um, the person who ported HPCC to the open power platform. So I think that has a lot of merit in itself. Uh, and he will be here with uh, Alan Kankel. He's from a company called Nalatec. Uh, Alan might be only one of the few people that can uh, uh, probably in this room code in. How many of you can or ever code it in VHDL or Verilog? FPGAs. One, two, three. Well, and Alan. <laughs> very good. So uh, please help me welcome JT and Alan uh, to the stage. Yeah, thanks, Flavio, for the, uh, the introduction there. I, I figured it's only fitting that since uh, we did our dry run when I was in my truck with my best man driving me to my bachelor party to, to come here on the honeymoon. But uh, yeah, Alan and I are, are real happy to, to be here today. We, we got started with this, uh, with LexisNexis and HPCC earlier this year. Um, now Tech engaged with, with Flavio and um, about trying to get better performance out of Thor and Roxy clusters, uh, doing acceleration with FPGAs. Alan quickly got involved and in, in, um, he started looking at it and, and figured out that you know, one of the big things that would probably help was porting to, op uh, to power and open power and taking advantage of our processor technology paired with the open power um, infrastructure. So today what I want to talk about, you know, we're kind of switching gears a little bit, getting to, to a hardware conversation, looking at ECL down. And so uh, first I want to give a little introduction about the open power, talking about why Alan and I are here on the stage together. Uh, just give a little information about the, the actual port itself, and then talk about Power8, give a little bit of background about how the key technologies in, in the Power8 processor and how that can feed um, the, the, what we view to be a path to um, higher performance in ex using FPGA acceleration. I'll hand that over to Alan, he'll, he'll go into those details. So the open power story, from a hardware perspective, you know, in the 90s and early, early 2000s, hardware designers were, were really leveraging technology improvements. We get a new generation of silicon and we map our, our design to the next generation of silicon and we see a 2x performance increase. You know, Moore's law where, you know, double the transistor count, it really kind of measured and, and it, it, we got 2x performance growth. Well, that started dying off, you know, probably 10 to 15 years ago. And so um, hardware vendors have been using uh, different methods to, to still get that 2x performance that customers uh, expect. And so at IBM, what we've done is we've integrated across, we're a system company, so we've integrated across the system to, to drive value at, at a system level. And we've done pretty well in that over the years, but then we, we looked at the industry, and, and there's a lot of great players in the industry doing very smart work in, in the I.O. domains and the system domain. And we said, well, we want to figure out a way to, to better collaborate and, and work with them. So we kind of changed gears where, you know, our, our biggest competition is Intel, and, and they're, a, they're a chip company. They're not a system company. So they've been taking all of these great innovations like FPGA computing, recently acquired Intel, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Altera, putting FPGAs on their chips, they've got GPUs on their chips, they've got networking on their chips in, in their socket, and, and they're kind of pulling thing into the chip. What we're doing is we're figuring out a way to open up the entire system to let other very savvy vendors like Nowatech, NVIDIA, Mellanox, et cetera, system companies, software stack, 
to, to open up our infrastructure, open up our architecture, and allow the industry to come together as a community and deliver value to the customer. So a little, about two years ago, Open Power was formed with five founding members, IBM, Google, Mellanox, NVIDIA. I'm sorry, not uh, Mellanox. Yes, Mellanox and NVIDIA. I think Tyann was in there pretty quickly too. And Nalatech joined very quickly. And in, and in this last two years, we've grown from, from five to, to, it's over 150 now, I think. So we've seen a lot of growth in, in all kinds of different areas. We're, we're integrating at the, you know, the chip level um, with companies in China making they're going to make the next power processor, um, which is pretty interesting, all the way up through uh, research companies and, and uh, system stack type areas. So this is really what IBM is, is trying to do is to, to match open source software and provide an open source, an open hardware technology to go along with that. So we compare those two together. So th the port. You know, a little bit of background here. Uh, the, the port was, was exceptionally easy, and, and a big part of that is because of the way HPC Systems is set up. With ECL being platform agnostic, we can change the hardware architecture out from underneath you, and it has no impact to you, which, which is great. That, that makes it really easy to do that. And, and then, additionally, the, the open source framework, you know, the, the way things are set up using common uh, build tools like CMake, CMake GCC, Binutils, Node.js, et cetera, uh, that makes a rapid transition to um, other architectures as well. Open source is very key here because, you know, a lot of times when we work with customers trying to get them to, to port to our new architecture, um, it, you have a lot of difficulties getting source code and, and taking a look. They don't want to share their code, et cetera. But with, with HPCC being open source, I just went and downloaded it, right? It was real easy. And we can go look at the source code. We can poke uh, here and there, et cetera. So we pair that with, with Power8. <clears throat> we've, uh, we've been you know, in the Linux space for a while now. But, but we, with Power8, we really kind of turned things around. We went to um, Little Endian, which was huge, because you know, x86 runs Little Endian, and to port to power in the past, you had to be conscious of how you stored the data. By going to a full Little Endian support, that's no longer an issue. So that makes things a lot easier. And then we've really done a lot of work in our, our software development kit to, to have our advanced tool chain for um, optimized libraries, doing, you know, post-link optimization, and then performance analysis tools. And, and also, you know, we started, we launched Power8 with full support for Ubuntu. Since we've grown to, to support for Red Hat and, and SUSE as well. Uh, the port itself, it took less than a week. I, I, don't, I don't know what the calendar time was, but, but uh, in, in hours, it was very simple. Um, just it, all we had to do was go in, add some architecture defines for the, for the new architecture, um, create this uh, stack descriptor for, for Power, and, and then, um, you know, just use bin utils, which was, was very easy. Those were the three changes to get it to compile. And I'm a hardware guy. I don't know really much about software. And I was able to do it myself. So that kind of speaks to how easy it was. Kudos to the, to the team for, for doing such a great job setting up your infrastructure. Um, the port went pretty quick. But the deployment took a little bit longer. Um, there were a couple of bugs found. Uh, m most, both two of the, the, the bigger bugs were just because I was on a, a newer version of Ubuntu that had, new compile, uh, had a newer compiler and some changes to the init system. There was one with um, some uh, alignment operations as we went to the new architecture, kind of exposed a bug with, with, um, for, with some of the atomic stuff. Um, and a, a big part of it, like I was the monkey on the keyboard, right? So, so I had to, to put, take off my hardware hat and put on a software hat and, and, and learn how to look at the code. Uh, it went very smooth. The, the basic setup was really easy. Flavio asked me to say, you know, what, what were the challenges that I had? And, and the biggest challenge that I had was, you, you know, HPCC is set up to, to provide a framework for you to write ECL code. But for me, I'm a hardware guy, and I want to get under the covers. So it was a little bit harder to, to understand how to do kind of system configuration type stuff. Maybe some more documentation for some of those things would be great, how to look at memory usage, thread support, et cetera. Um, so th let's take a look at Power8. So the Open Power Initiative is great to innovate across the system, but you really have to have a strong CPU to take advantage of system-level optimizations. 
Um, I don't want to bore you with too many hardware details, so I've highlighted the things that are really kind of key for, for this environment, for this big data workload. We really are designed for big data. Uh, we've got up to 12 cores per socket at SMT8, so that gives you 96 hardware threads per socket. Um, to feed that, we, we've, we support up to a terabyte of, of memory per socket at 230 gigabytes per second. So that's uh, quite a bit of, of speed there. We have some things in our, in our architecture, new in Power 8, transactional memory, which helps when you, um, when, you, when you have all those cores and you have contention over data, you know, the, uh, the, the parallel processing paradigm, transactional memory should help with some of that, uh, you know, the atomic overhead, et cetera. And then to, to feed the processor, you know, this is big data. You guys are talking petabytes, exabytes, whatever of data. Um, you got to have, a, you got to be able to get data in there. Sorry for the typo there, but we've got 48 lanes of PCIe Gen 3 um, capabilities per socket. So, so that's quite a bit of data bandwidth coming in to, to feed the beast. And then a new thing that, that in, in Power 8 that came out is, is CAPI. Um, I'm actually the CAPI enablement team lead, and so this is close to home for me. But what we've done is we've taken, you know, industry standard. Um, PCIe technology and, and put a little twist on top of it. And, and we do this, any PCIe device you can attach with, attach with CAPI, you could, could build an ASIC that has some of the, the CAPI capabilities, but what we've kind of keyed on lately has been FPGA acceleration. This is a trend that's been in the industry for, you know, Alan's been doing it for 20 years, and, and people have been really pulling this into um, the uh, enterprise class servers. And, and we've just added a little bit to it. We've taken FPGA acceleration and, and given it the ability to be uh, coherent, which is huge. Um, because there, there's lots of advantages for that, some performance, some, and one of the biggest is, is ease of programming, ease of, of uh, taking these acceleration plays and pulling them into your application. You can treat the, the FPGA as a, as a, a peer processor, um, you know, a hollow core, somebody calls it. So, so that, that's a, a very key um, invention for some of the, the um, work that we're going to be doing here. I list the advantages. You see the, the I.O. model flow there with the traditional PCIe stack. There's lots of device driver overhead to, to get the FPGA or PCIe device kicked off. With CAPI, it's real easy. It's, it's a shared memory model, so, so you um, basically have the application tell it to go, and it goes, and you talk directly with the with the application running on the, on the accelerator. And it also opens up the ability to do some workloads that you couldn't normally do with PCIe traffic. Uh, similar to like RDMA, but, but um, a little bit easier. So what, one of the, th there's many CAPI products out there, but one that we find key for this area is, is our CAPI flash implementation. So wh what we've done, it, it, we, we looked at our CAPI flash architect, our flash attach architecture, and you can see on the, the left hand side there, um, that's the, the typical stack to, to get a, a flash drawer connected to your processor. And then on the right hand side, you see with CAPI, you, you re significantly reduce the, the programming stack there. So that, that the, the number there, 20,000 20, instructions to, to, to get in and out of a flash drive reduces down to a, a couple thousand. So that has, you know, lots of, there's lots of benefits to that. One is code path, you reduce, reduce code path, you're going to increase performance. Um, and also the ability to free up your cores to do the work that you want to do. Rather than managing your I.O. devices for you, your, your hard, you know, your, your storage for you, you free up your cores to do the real work that, that needs to be done. <laughs> So this is a kind of a pictorial thing here. Um, on the, the left-hand side on the bottom there, we've got a, a 2U um, IBM S822L. That's a two-socket server. Um, it, you know, up to 24 cores, up to two terabytes of memory, et cetera. And then on the top, we have a, a IBM Flash Systems drawer. And those, you can get those up to 56 uh, terabytes of, of data in a flash drawer there. And we did experiments um, hooking up the flash drawer with the traditional conventional I.O. fiber channel, and then CAPI attached. And what you see is because of the reduced, uh, two things happen there. One, the reduced code link path be, um, getting in and out of the device. You see a performance improvement there. And additionally, there, there's some offload, some CPU offload 
of the, the, the file system onto the FPGA. So what that results in is a 5x better um, IOPS, uh, input output transactions per second per hardware thread and, and a reduced code latency. So what this has done is it's taking flash, which is typically looked at as, as flash as a fast storage, and we've kind of changed the paradigm and, and we're starting to make flash look like slower memory. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Alan. He's gonna talk about some future direction stuff. Thanks, JT. So um, I'm, I'm going to just go into a little bit more detail on what IBM has been doing with the data-centric architectural approach. I'm going to try and explain what we mean by moving from this processor-centric to data-centric and sh show you some of the, some of the complications that, 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 that exist today in, in tr more traditional server architectures. I'm also going to talk a little bit more about FPGA acceleration, very high level. So first of all, a question. H uh, how many of you are familiar with FPGAs for, acceler for compute acceleration? Okay, only a few. So I, I guess that. Unfortunately, I don't have time for a complete lesson in, in FPGAs, but they are, they're a special type of processor, and um, I, I've got a, a fairly simplistic graph which will, which will hopefully paint a, 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 a basic picture for you to get the grasp of why these devices and GPUs are being used to complement microprocessors in, uh, in, in different uh, workload areas. So just a quick uh, uh, bit about Nalatec. We've been, it, we've been in the area of FPGA acceleration for over 20 years. This isn't new. I think um, uh, Flavio might have mentioned uh, basically there is a, there is a low-level language called VHDL and Verilog for programming these devices. It's a really hard to program these devices. So the people with, uh, with strong hearts over the years have, have, have gone through the pain of the acceleration where they really need it, but it really hasn't made it to the mainstream. Um, but, but now it's really beginning to make some serious traction and it's got some very strong benefits for the world of uh, big data, data analytics. Nalatec's been working it for 20 years. We work with two, uh, th the actual chip vendors are Altera and Xilinx are the two biggest chip vendors. And we've been collaborating with IBM on open power. That's been tremendous, uh, being able to get in at the heart of these architectures and, and help influence the changes. Um, our, our expertise um, is demonstrated. We're actually in, in production with IBM System Z mainframe platform, so our, our, our products are embedded in there, and we've de delivered a number of thousand node clusters uh, with FPGA. So this isn't, this isn't really that new, guys, so it's, um, and, and hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll be able to leverage it yourselves. So looking at the motivation for heterogeneous computing and using different processor types, um, you know, it, it, the JT talked about the power wall, the hit in the power wall, Moore's law not scaling. But back in 1998, DARPA did a study, and they, 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 they defined the perfect processor being a polymorphic uh, processor, polymorphic computing. And this graph just shows you the ideal efficiency, swept efficiency, they called it, size, weight, energy, performance, and time for how quickly you want something to operate um, or, or for your particular problem. And then they talked about data types across the x-axis. And what they did is they actually plotted a processor and, uh, well, ideally the polymorphic processor would be equally good at all data types uh, for all problem sets. But it, th th an early version, they actually plotted um, uh, the microprocessor and an FPGA on it. And I've taken a bit of artistic license to cut to the chase here um, of showing where we're really at today. The key point I want to, you to take away is the FPGA processors on the side, you can see they're the best at bit level processing and stream processing. Um, two areas which are, are particularly important in the big data area. Microprocessors, multi-core, very good at the complex symbolic type data, data operations in vector, and the GPUs are, are really uh, leading the field in the, in the SIMD area. So using all three types of processors, you can actually get to um, the most efficient compute solution for your problem. So just restating, and FPGAs today are software accessible, which I'll just cover in a moment. But just to restate, FPGAs are best at in the pipe stream computing. We've got a lot of data moving around. We build compute engines around the data. That's extremely efficient. Um, and we're highly parallel uh, for, for bit and byte level uh, computation, which, which you guys do an awful lot of. So, but now, the big step change, which is really making a much broader adoption, is that they're programmable. 
They're programmable with a language called OpenCL. Is everybody, hands up, everyone is aware of OpenCL? Okay, not as many as I thought there were. So that, that's, that's, um, that was a language that was really invented with the GPUs. Apple, Apple started it, and it's actually buried in the or Mac OS X. You can use it. Uh, it's a part of the OS uh, with, with Apple. But basically, it's been adopted by all the CPU players, IBM, Intel support it, um, and all of the FPGA players. So you've got one, it's a low-level explicitly parallel language that you can use to program, it, program all of these devices. Um, and, and, so, and, and so that brings a good, a, a good bit of, a, of benefit. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, is because it's being adopted as a heterogeneous language of choice, it is developing uh, in, in, the work, in the working group uh, to, to support heterogeneous computing even more. So switching gears to um, Flavio kindly gave me a, 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 a basic background of, of, of a four and, and Roxy cluster and a node. This is just showing the typical node configuration of the memory that's attached and uh, the storage attached. The fundamental difference between a basic four and ro Roxy um, node is, is that the, uh, Roxy uses SSDs. You get, you get more Im improved bandwidth and you get tremendously improved IOP uh, uh, functions with, with, with Roxy. Um, I've also shown the green arrows are showing what was effectively the memory bus. Um, of, of the architecture and, and the I.O. bus, the PCI I.O. bus is shown in, in yellow, and you'll see the network and the storage is attached to the I.O. So, um, and, and as a cluster, the, the just showing the, the complete clusters, on the left is, is the four cluster, um, and um, it's a bit smaller, I'm not sure if you can read the, read the writing there, but uh, um, on, on CPU intensive operations on fragmented data, you're doing it, you've got an awful lot of network traffic over this one gigabyte per second. So that's really the weakest link in your, in, in your CPU intensive on fragmented data. On the mapper type parallel functions, you've got a tremendous amount of aggregate bandwidth, 160 gigabytes per second, 56K IOPS. Uh, with Roxy, um, because you've got a very good, you've got good indexed, uh, um, uh, uh, You've got good indexation. That that means that you can get over some of the network issues, um, and you have m greatly improved our IOPS to your to your storage. So, but let's take a quick cl closer look at memory coherency and, and data movement conflict. When when you actually um, look at, let's take a look at a mapper type needle in a haystack uh, operation, where you've got really little to no compute going on uh, on lots and lots of data. Uh, on a current processor-centric architecture, you'll see that we've got one to 100. The, the memory bandwidth is 100 times the I.O. bandwidth. So this is, this is fairly forgiving of this type of architecture. You know, so it's not a problem so for the Xeon, so why do we need to worry about it? Well, let's just take a closer look. The burden of using a CPU-centric architecture for data-centric problems is that data from the storage goes into memory, goes through all the caches, does a simple operation, then if there's a result that comes out of that, it'll then goes back through all the, all the memory layers back into that storage. An awful lot of data movement for such a trivial operation. And um, so it really does, although the Xeon can cope with it very easily, it creates a lot of unnecessary traffic congestion on the I.O. I.O. management consumes CPU threads, excessive cache thrashing, you know, only eight 4K IOPS fills up a level 132K cache. Um, so you get really tremendous power and efficiency issues with all of this unnecessary data movement. Surely there's a better way. Um, equally, um, on, 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 a, on a, a processor intensive operations on fragmented data, you need to pull that data from the storage through the CPU and deliver it to the CPU that wants it so it can do its compute. And again, you're, you're, you're burning cycles, doing nothing but moving data around in that CPU that you'd rather have for your data-intensive operations, uh, your compute-intensive operations. So um, but this, this burden just carries on and, 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 and causes these, these issues. You get network congestion over that relatively low bandwidth, um, expensive, lo 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 large latencies uh, beca can become big issues very quickly. Um, and as I said, less CPU cycles um, and memory cache available for your compute intensive operations. So um, these are some subtleties that are, aren't necessarily always off, are obvious. So, um, but, you know, but again, it's not been a problem. You've, got, you've, been, you've been quite successful to date with, with these wi white box architectures, commodity, commodity cl clusters. So they're still winning out, right? But maybe um, 
it, it, we've, we've really got a problem coming towards us. Well, and it, well it's, it's great news, really, because storage is getting a lot, lot faster with NVMe. We've seen it with SSDs. It's only getting even faster. And if you take a 24-disc uh, drawer in, in, inside a server today, with NVMe drives, you could get 72 gigabytes per second of storage bandwidth. That's huge compared to your systems today. In fact, it's the same size as your memory bandwidth. Now, if we run those same scenarios I just talked to you about in a processor-centric architecture, you completely swamp the CPU, and there's nothing left for you to do compute. <laughs> so we, we've got to move to a more data-centric architecture. And this is what IBM really initiated with their open power and CAPI. And um, I, I want to try and articulate that. So this is pretty much just a fairly similar setup, slightly different speeds, higher speed memory, higher speed disk, disk storage. Um, so the architecture is better to, to begin with. Um, but, but really, with CAPI, they bring the coherent accelerator processor uh, interface. And it, it, they use the PCI transport to be able to actually run this, 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 uh, this interface. So what does that actually mean? What it really means is they've taken the storage and they've put it on the memory bus, uh, is effectively what's happening with the CAP engine inside. So what JT said about that storage drawer is shown there. Um, so, so suddenly that burden of, of the data moving through the CPU is taking off. Not only have they done it there, they've done it with a network controller. So you can actually bring the network straight into the data plane. And then you've got the symmetrical multiprocessing bus for, for attaching um, up to 16 Power 8 processors over a very, very high speed, um, uh, uh, hundreds of times faster than a, network, a, a traditional network bus. So what you can see there is that, that Power 8 processor, it, with all the, tra all the data traffic is now moving through the memory plane, and the Power 8 is actually idle, sat, it, sat on the side of the, memory of the data plane, waiting for it, 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 the, the data that it, it needs to do its, its work on. So you've got all of those threads are free for your application, not just moving data around. Um, and so the, the Capi Flash storage, um, uh, so, so what we can do, so that, that, that's basically articulated what, what JT said in the, in the current Capi attached flash storage. But the FPGA, as you can see, that's attaching that and, and doing the CAPI translation, that's all it's doing. It's translating I.O. to storage into this, memory, this block memory uh, CAPI attach. And, um, but we're, we're now looking to say, well, OK, what else can we put in that FPGA? So remember, FPGAs are good at streaming and bit manipulation. So we can increase the CAPI flash bandwidth. That's already um, uh, in, in progress with more CAPI ports. Um, but we can also introduce acceleration uh, into, the, uh, into the FPJ as well as the translation. So we can now, t because the FPJ is so good at data processing on data on the move, it can actually consume that 96 gigabytes per second. It's very good at compression, encryption, filtering operations, in the, as I said, bit and byte level. And it's extremely power efficient at these operations. So it can do some of the mapper functions, some of the embarrassingly parallel functions and leave the power rate for the very uh, heavy workload compute functions. So just looking at, the, um, at some physical implementations, this is the uh, uh, dual power core P822L box uh, that J JT uh, briefly mentioned. This is showing um, the maximum configuration there. That, that's, that pr we, we can probably build other configurations actually bigger than that. But this is showing the, mo the, the biggest populated each drawer is 56 terabytes of, of, of uh, flash. You've got one terabyte of memory per processor. These could go as small as uh, two terabytes per, per disk on that, so uh, eight terabytes per, per box in, in, inside the 2U box. Um, and you've got uh, the, the four gigabytes of bandwidth. So this could be a traditional scale-out Roxy in four cluster, a, 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 base, a base configuration. Um, we could add acceleration in with the FPGAs, and suddenly we could leverage the much more significant bandwidth to the storage uh, for, for, the, for the mapper parallel functions and the, the heavy compute, the, the, the P8s are, are there for that. Maybe the balance of this isn't quite right for, um, uh, for, for the functionality, so you might want more to add more processors uh, for, for this. Um, so then if you look at the uh, IBM E817-880 architectures, this is the scalable symmetric multiprocessing. So what we're doing here is we're saying, OK, let's look at a scale-out architecture with the FPJs attached to the disks for doing uh, the mapper-type uh, functions. 
And um, let's look at a scale-up architecture with very high bandwidth between the processors for doing the compute intensive across the fragmented data sets. Um, so you can see we've got tremendous bandwidths uh, moving around between the processors compared to a traditional network. And you can take that all the way up to a 16-way configuration. So this, this example is based on the E880. You would get up to 4 terabytes per second uh, to 16 terabytes of memory. And, uh, your, and a petabyte of storage um, it, it, it a terabyte per second of access to that storage. So, so hopefully that's, that's giving you a little bit of a flavor of the directions we're going in with the part of open power and where we believe we can bring significant acceleration to, to, the, to, 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 to HPCC and the ECL. So in summary, HPC systems and open power, we're, 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 we're really ready for business. IBM's Power8 data-centric architecture is really ideal for big data problems. FPGAs do provide an ideal streaming near storage accelerator. And if we, we, we truly believe we've got an opportunity to re-architect some of the ECL for a Power8 with FPGA acceleration. It will provide a step change in the performance at a lower power and footprint. And but you know, it's gonna need a community effort. And, and if, if there's a call to action from this presentation, it's saying, hey guys, you know, we're, we're, we're ready to go. You guys um, know the ECL code base far better than, than IBM or ourselves. And it's, uh, uh, coming to open power, join the collaboration, and let's see what we can, we can do with the, uh, with the open power architecture. Thanks very much. JT, just to make sure I understand, the CAPI interface is independent of the type of flash storage, right? It doesn't have to be any specific type of flash storage. Currently, it's limited to our IBM flash systems, and that, that's the current technology that we have is, is with our, um, our flash systems. What is it? 840, eight, eight yeah, it's 840, I think, and a, and a 900. Uh, drawer. Th those are the only two that it works with. Okay, but it's, is the plan to make it compatible with, or figure out a way by which other flash storage systems can be compatible with it, or is it limited to? It can certainly be done. We we were in conversations with with other people to to look at other flash technologies, okay. as well as with with Nalatech going, kind of the next generation. He was talking about with the smaller configurations. There's a lot of growth uh, potential there for sure. Okay, and just one follow up. Uh, irrespective of FPGA acceleration. Did you have to do anything with the HPCC to make it work with CAPI attached flash? We haven't yet gone to the CAPI flash okay, approach. And there, there will be some, some work that's done there because the, the interface to CAPI flash is the, the block API. It's a block API. So there would have to be some work done on the HPCC software to, to, to get it to utilize the, the block API. Gotcha. That's it. No, so no, uh, no, no questions for the hardware guys. Oh, okay, sir. So, uh, pretty clearly, the end state, or the desirable end state, would be to have some of the ECL compilation produce um, code for the FPGA. Now, historically, putting new functions in an FPGA, they they it was pretty slow to write there. Is the state of the art such now that it's possible to have per thread or per process code in an FPGA? So, a couple of things. Uh, it's, it's, it's much quicker. Um, so, so the, the OpenCL gives you a C-level language, so you can actually write functions and get to the FPGA really quickly today. Um, and. Um, our engineers, we, we've been porting customers' codes or helping customers port code for, for many years. And so our engineers' productivity, productivity has gone up dramatically when we use the OpenCL, okay? So, so there is that approach. It, in terms of integrating it all in with Open Power, we're still working through some of that, uh, but it's, it's generally available as a PCI attached, getting it, all the CAPI attached is up and running just, uh, in fact, that is running today, I, I beg, beg your pardon. Um, but the other approach is, is you can look at the FPJ as, a, as a, like a, a library function. So you can put functionality in it, and it's a function call to it. 
Um, so, and you can blend the two as well. So the actual, you can abstract it away from the user uh, more as a, a function, as a function call. Um, and um, in, in, ter in, in working with Flavio as well, he was saying that potentially you could put some hints in the ECL code itself that could say, hey, go ahead and use the accelerator for this, this particular uh, operation. So where the user can have some control over, over these features. Yeah. From the way you're talking around it, it sounds like it still takes possibly a couple of seconds to reflash the FPGA. No, oh, so, so, right, so in terms of um, functionality on, on from that perspective, you're, you're talking, of, so you re reload the FPGA you, you, um, with a new bit stream for a new function. Yeah, so you want to tailor a filter or adjust. Yeah, yeah. So, so either you can, you can either have them static and running from power up, or um, you can load them, and there's a dynamic. You actually load through the uh, PCI interface. And so that takes about, um, to, th today that takes a, a few hundred milliseconds. But partial reconfiguration, this is a little bit more of a future thing, the partial reconfiguration would allow you to load in smaller functions, which would then take in, in the order of a millisecond or, or, or less. OK, so the, the model would be a, a library, a collection of bits and pieces that could be strung together to make on-the-fly filters. Right, the, the, the on-the-fly filters, the actual compile time of a new design, it, it's a lot longer to compile for the FPGA, but once you have the bit stream, the load time it can, can, be, can, be, can be quite fast. And you can have multiple functions so buried in it. So if, if, you, if you know you're always going to use encryption and compression in a, in a filter, you could put a programmable filter that has lots of, of capability a, a, across, you know, in a one bit stream. So you don't need to reload. You load the, the computational architecture that you need, and it just stays there for, the, for, for your particular task. Thank you. I think there was one more question in the middle of the room. Uh, um, how do you compare uh, CAPI with uh, RDMA? Uh, is there a um, direct comparison that you can make or maybe just the conceptual one? I would say that I, I probably shouldn't have, have used it. The, when you look at the, the networking side of, of things, RDMA is becoming very popular. And what it what RDMA allows you to do is to, for the traditionally I.O. devices and processor cores weren't able to, to share memory uh, just because of you know, deadlock cases and the lack of coherency, et cetera. RDMA in the networking side has uh, created that the ability for you to, to share um, application memory, to share virtual memory, uh, essentially. And CAPI takes it to uh, the next level. Um, because with RDMA, you still have to recode your application uh, to, to there's set, set um, special memory allocation schemes to get memory for RDMA to, to, to share. But with CAPI, uh, when you want to share memory, you just malloc or, or um, what, whatever. You just use standard memory allocation routines and then just point the, uh, the CAPI attached device to that memory. There's, there's no overhead. There's, the, it makes the, the, the code changes a lot less invasive because it's truly shared virtual memory. There's no special libraries behind it. Um, there's, there's no device driver at all. So could it be abstracted over an RDMA-capable device? Like, can you have a Mellanox card there that you can uh, So what Mellanox is actually, you know, they've got the RDMA technology. They are also going to do a CAPI um, device as well. And the reason that they're doing that is, is because RDMA is, like, like we said, it's great, but it's hard to adopt. It's hard to get people to go change their code base. It's very difficult to do that. So with CAPI, they can take the same advantages of having shared memory to reduce latency and increase performance, but do it without any rip up to the to application code. So that, that's one of the key differences between RDMA and CAPI. It's a good question. I think there was one more question. Hi. No? Um, okay. If an HP, if HP comes through with their memory store technology, what will be the impact on CAPI? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. The, the if the HP comes through with their memory store technology, what will be the impact on CAPI Flash? 
That's a good question. Um, there, that is going to be a disruptive, it is a disruptive technology for sure, right? But there, there still are trade-offs because the way that that is going to fit in, it, it, it's still unclear how to, how to make it work because of right now when you look at Flash, it's hard to get people to, to think about anything other than memory and disk, right? And so when you in, introduce that technology, sure, you can replace all of your, your DDR memory with, with this new technology, but you are going to lose performance. It's not as fast as DRAM, right? So, so you can make a choice where, where either you come up with some you know, three-tiered uh, scheme now where you have DRAM, you know, traditional memory, then there's something that looks kind of like memory, and then storage, which is a lot, it's going to be a lot harder to adapt or you can replace your DRAM with this, this new technology. And there are certainly going to be cases where, where that's going to win. And, and yes, that, that is going to be disruptive. We think that, that with you know, the CAPI Flash, we, we have a similar technology. The, you know, the cost is going to be probably comparable, and the performance might be a little less, but we have a lot more flexibility. I think, I think the, key, the key message there, and the, what IBM have really done with CAPI Flash is they're making storage look more like memory. Memory is storage, storage is memory. Why do we categorize the two uh, differently? That's a historic reason and for good reason with spinning disks, but suddenly memory, you know, they're, they're beginning to treat storage like memory. When you guys move to in-memory databases, suddenly you tripped over, you, you say that the persistence problem uh, you know, with, with these big databases, so therefore you attach flash for backup when power was lost. So, so every, th th if you look at the transition over the last few, good few years, we are beginning to say, let's, let's just treat this all as memory. And, and so you're talking about another tier of memory that, that sits between us as, uh, between DRAM and storage and flash. Thanks, Thank you Fabio. So Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Very good. This was cool. I hope it wasn't too deep into the metal for those that are more software centric. But I thought it was a very good presentation on not just what we can do today, but also what we could do in future. And, and this might be a, a way to really leap forward uh, if we start to adopt this type of technologies.